Asleep by Wilfred Owen Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Under his helmet, up against his pack, After so many days of work and waking, Sleep took him by the brow and laid him back. There, in the happy no-time of his sleeping, Death took him by the heart. There heaved a quaking of frustrate life, Like child within him leaping, and chest and sleepy arms once more fell slack. And soon the slow stray blood comes creeping from the intrusive lead, like ants on track. Whether his deeper sleep lies shaded by the shaking of great wings and the thoughts of stars, high pillowed on calm pillows of God's making, above these clouds, these rains, these sleets of lead, and these winds' scimitars, or whether yet his thin and sodden head confuses more and more with the low mould, his hair being one with the grey grass of finished fields and wire scrags rusty old, who knows, who hopes, who troubles, let it pass, he sleeps, he sleeps less tremulous, less cold than we who wake, and waking say, alas! End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ballade du Temps Jadis, The Ballad of the Dead Ladies by François Villon, translated by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, read by Hal Slam. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Tell me now. In what hidden way is the Lady Flora, the lovely Roman? Where is Hipparchia, and where is Thais? Neither of them the fairer woman. Where is Echo, beheld of no man, only heard on river and mere, she whose beauty was more than human? But where are the snows of yesteryear? Where is Eloise, the learned nun, for whose sake Abelard, I ween, lost manhood and put priesthood on? From love he won such doolentine. And where, I pray you, is the queen who willed That Buridan should steer, sewed in a sack's mouth down the Seine? But where are the snows of yesteryear? White Queen Blanche, like a queen of lilies, With a voice like any Myrmidon, Bertha Broadfoot, Beatrice, Alice, and Ermengarde, The Lady of Maine, and that good Joan, whom Englishmen at Rouen doomed and burned her there. Mother of God, where are they then? But where are the snows of yesteryear? Nay, never ask this week, fair Lord, where they are gone, nor yet this year, except with this for an overword. But where are the snows of yesteryear? Bond and Free by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Siddharth Love has earth to which she clings, With hills and circling arms about, Wall within wall to shut fear out. But thought has need of no such things, For thought has a pair of dauntless wings. On snow and sand and turf I see, Where love has left a printed trace, With straining in the world's embrace. And such is love and glad to be, But thought has shaken his ankles free. Thought cleaves the interstellar gloom, And sits in serious disc all night, Till day makes him retrace his flight, With smell of burning on every bloom, Back past the sun to an earthly room. His gains in heaven are what they are, Yet some say love by being thrall, And simply staying possesses all, In several beauty that thought fares far, To find fused in another star. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Burbank with the Baedecker, Bleistein with the Cigar, by T. S. Eliot, read for LibriVox.org by Miss Avarice. Tra la 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 la, nil nisi divinum stabile est, cayetera fumus. The gondola stopped. The old palace was there. How charming its grey and pink, goats and monkeys, with such hair too. So the countess passed on until she came through the little park, 
where Niobe presented her with a cabinet, and so departed. Burbank crossed a little bridge, descending at a small hotel. Princess Volupine arrived. They were together, and he fell. Defunctive music under the sea passed seaward with the passing bell. Slowly, the god Hercules had left him that had loved him well. The horses under the axle tree beat up the dawn from Istria with even feet. Her shuttered barge burned on the water all the day. But this, or such, was Bleistein's way, a saggy bending of the knees and elbows with the palms turned out, a Chicago Semite Viennese. A lusterless, protrusive eye stares from the protozoic slime at a perspective of Canaletto, the smoky candle end of time. Declines, on the Rialto once. The rats are underneath the piles. The Jew is underneath the lot. Money and furs. The boatman smiles. Princess Volupine extends a meager, blue-nailed, tizic hand to climb the water stair. Lights! Lights! She entertains Sir Ferdinand. Klein, who clipped the lion's wings and fleed his rump and pared his claws, thought Burbank, meditating on time's ruins and the seven laws. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Daniel Jazz by Vashel Lindsay, read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio, June 2011. Darius the Mede was a king and a wonder. His eye was proud and his voice was thunder. He kept bad lions in a monstrous den. He fed up the lions on Christian men. Daniel was the chief hired man of the land. He stirred up the jazz in the palace band. He whitewashed the cellar, he shoveled in the coal, and Daniel kept a praying, Lord, save my soul. Daniel kept a praying, Lord, save my soul. Daniel kept a praying, Lord, save my soul. Daniel was the butler, swagger and swell. He ran upstairs, he answered the bell, and he would let in whoever came a-calling. Saints so holy, scamps so appalling. Old man Ahab leaves his card. Elisha and the bears are awaiting in the yard. Here comes Pharaoh and his snakes a calling. Here comes Cain and his wife a calling. Shadrach, Beshach, and Abednego for tea. Here comes Jonah and the whale and the sea. Here comes St. Peter and his fishing pole. Here comes Judas and his silver a calling. Here comes old Beelzebub a calling. And Daniel kept a praying, Lord, save my soul. Daniel kept a praying, Lord, save my soul. Daniel kept a praying, Lord, save my soul. His sweetheart and his mother were Christian and meek. They washed and ironed for Darius every week. One Thursday he met them at the door, paid them as usual, but acted sore. He said, Your Daniel is a dead little pigeon. He's a good hard worker, but he talks religion. And he showed them Daniel in the lion's cage, Daniel standing quietly, the lions in a rage. His good old mother cried, Lord, save him! And Daniel's tender sweetheart cried, Lord, save him! And she was a golden lily in the dew, And she was as sweet as an apple on the tree, And she was as fine as a melon in the cornfield, Gliding and lovely as a ship on the sea, Gliding and lovely as a ship on the sea. And she prayed to the Lord, Send Gabriel, send Gabriel. King Darius said to the lions, Bite Daniel, bite Daniel, bite him, bite him, bite him. Thus swore the lions, We want Daniel, 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 we want Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. Grrr. 
and daniel did not frown daniel did not cry he kept on looking at the sky and the lord said to gabriel uh, go chain the lions down 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 and gabriel chained the lions and gabriel chained the lions and gabriel chained the lions and daniel got out of the den and daniel got out of the den and daniel got out of the den and darius said you're a christian child darius said you're a christian child darius said you're a christian child and gave him his job again and gave him his job again and gave him his job again End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Grand Rapids Cricket Club by Julia A. Moore Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Perth, Western Australia In Grand Rapids is a handsome club Of men that cricket play As fine a set of skilful men That can their skill display They are the champions of the West they think they are quite fine they've won a hundred honours well it is their most cunning design brave kelso he's considered great chief of the club he is found great crowds he draws to see him bowl the ball upon the ground a mr follett is very brave a lighter player than the rest he got struck severe at the fair ground for which he took a rest when Mr. Dennis does well play, his courage is full great, and accidents to him occur, but not much, though, of late. This ball play is a dangerous game, brave knights to play it, though. Those boys would be the nation's pride, if they to war would go. From Milwaukee their club did come, with thoughts of skill at play, but beat they was, and then went home, had nothing more to say. Grand Rapids Club that cricket play will soon be known afar. Much prouder do the members stand, like many a noble star. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Inscription on the Monument of a Newfoundland Dog by George Gordon Lord Byron. Read for LibriVox.org by Bob Gonzalez. When some proud son of man returns to earth, Unknown to glory but upheld by birth, The sculptor's art exhausts the pomp of woe, And storied urns record who rest below. When all is done, upon the tomb is seen Not what he was, but what he should have been. But the poor dog, in life the firmest friend, The first to welcome, foremost to defend, whose honest heart is still his master's own, who labors, fights, lives, breathes for him alone. Unhonored falls, unnoticed all his worth, denied in heaven the soul he held on earth. While man, vain insect, hopes to be forgiven, and claims himself a sole exclusive heaven, O oh, man, thou feeble tenant of an hour, debased by slavery or corrupt by power who knows thee well must quit thee with disgust degraded mass of animated dust thy love is lust thy friendship all a cheat thy smiles hypocrisy thy words deceit by nature vile ennobled but by name each kindred brute might bid thee blush for shame ye who perchance behold this simple urn pass on it honors none you wish to mourn to mark a friend's remains these stones arise i never knew but one and here he lies end of poem this recording is in the public domain Little Boy Blue by Eugene Field, read for LibriVox.org by Sherry Gardner. 
The little toy dog is covered with dust, but sturdy and staunch he stands. The little toy soldier is red with rust and his musket molds in his hands. Time was when the little toy dog was new, and the soldier was passing fair, and that was the time when our little boy Blue kissed them and put them there. Now don't you go till I come, he said, and don't you make any noise. So toddling off to his trundle bed, he dreamt of the pretty toys. And, as he was dreaming, an angel song awakened our little boy Blue. Oh, the years are many, the years are long, but the little toy friends are true. I, faithful to little boy Blue, they stand, each in the same old place, awaiting the touch of a little hand, the smile of a little face. And they wonder, as waiting the long years through in the dust of that little chair, what has become of our little boy Blue since he kissed them and put them there. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lucifer in Starlight by George Meredith Read for LibriVox.org by Bob Gonzalez On a starred night Prince Lucifer uprose. Tired of his dark dominion, Swung the fiend above the rolling ball In cloud part screened, Where sinners hugged their spectre of repose. Poor prey to his hot fit of pride were those. And now upon his western wing he leaned, Now his huge bulk o'er Afric's sands careened, Now the black planet shadowed arctic snows, Soaring through wider zones that pricked his scars With memory of the old revolt from awe, He reached a middle height, And at the stars, which are the brain of heaven, He looked and sank. Around the ancient track marched rank on rank The army of unalterable law. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lycidas by John Milton Read for LibriVox by The Bicycle Thief In this monody the author bewails a learned friend, unfortunately drowned in his passage from Chester on the Irish seas, 1637, and by occasion foretells the ruin of our corrupted clergy, then in their height. Yet once more, O ye laurels, and once more ye myrtles brown, with ivy never sear, I come to pluck your berries harsh and crude, And with forced fingers rude, Shatter your leaves before the mellowing year. Bitter constraint and sad occasion, dear, Compels me to disturb your season due. For Lycidas is dead, dead ere his prime, Young Lycidas, and hath not left his peer. Who would not sing for Lycidas? He knew himself to sing, and build the lofty rhyme. He must not float upon his watery bier, Unwept and welter to the parching wind, Without the mead of some melodious tear. Begin then, sisters of the sacred well, That from beneath the seat of Jove doth spring, Begin, and somewhat loudly sweep the string, Hence, with denial vain and coy excuse, So may some gentle muse, With lucky words, favour my destined urn, And, as he passes, turn, And bid fair peace be to my sable shroud. For we were nursed upon the self-same hill, Fed the same flock by fountain, shade, and rill. Together both, ere the high lawns appeared, under the opening eyelids of the morn, We drove afield, and both together heard, What time the grey fly winds her sultry horn. Battening our flocks with the fresh dews of night, 
oft till the star that rose at evening bright toward heaven's descent had sloped his westering wheel meanwhile the rural ditties were not mute tempered to the oaten flute rough satyrs danced and fawns with cloven heel from the glad sound would not be absent long and old demetus loved to hear our song but o oh, the heavy change now thou art gone now thou art gone and never must return thee shepherd thee the woods and desert caves with wild thyme and the gadding vine o'ergrown and all their echoes mourn the willows and the hazel copses green shall now no more be seen fanning their joyous leaves to thy soft lays as killing as the canker to the rose or taint worm to the weanling herds that graze or frost to flowers that their gay wardrop wear when first the white thorn blows such lycidas thy loss to shepherd's ear where were ye nymphs when the remorseless deep closed o'er the head of your loved lycidas for neither were ye playing on the steep where your old bards the famous druids lie nor on the shaggy top of mona high nor yet where deva spreads her wizard stream ay me i fondly dream had ye been there for what could that have done what could the muse herself that orpheus bore the muse herself for her enchanting son whom universal nature did lament when by the rout that made the hideous roar his gory visage down the stream was sent down the swift hebrus to the lesbian shore alas what boots it with incessant care to tend the homely slighted shepherd's trade and strictly meditate the thankless muse were it not better done as others use to sport with amaryllis in the shade or with the tangles of nearer's hair fame is the spur that the clear spirit doth raise that last infirmity of noble mind to scorn delights and live laborious days but the fair guerdon when we hope to find and think to burst out into sudden blaze comes the blind fury with the abhorred shears and slits the thin spun life but not the praise phoebus replied and touched my trembling ears fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil nor in the glistering foil set off to the world nor in broad rumour lies but lives and spreads aloft by those pure eyes and perfect witness of all judging jove as he pronounces lastly on each deed of so much fame in heaven expect thy meed o fountain arethuse and thou honoured flood smooth sliding mincius crowned with vocal reeds that strain i heard was of a higher mood but now my oat proceeds and listens to the herald of the sea that came in neptune's plea he asked the waves and asked the felon winds what hard mishap hath doomed this gentle swain and questioned every gust of rugged wings that blows from off each beaked promontory they knew not of his story and sage hippotades their answer brings that not a blast was from his dungeon strayed the air was calm and on the level brine sleek panope with all her sisters played it was that fatal and perfidious bark built in the eclipse and rigged with curses dark that sunk so low that sacred head of thine next came us reverend sire went footing slow his mantle hairy and his bonnet sedge inwrought with figures dim and on the edge like to that sanguine flower inscribed with woe ah who hath reft quoth he my dearest pledge last came and last did go 
the pilot of the Galilean lake. Two massy keys he bore of metals twain, the golden opes, the iron shuts amain. He shook his mitred locks, and sternly spake, How well could I have spared for thee, young swain? And now of such as for their belly's sake Creep and intrude and climb into the fold, Of other care they little reckoning make Than how to scramble at the shearer's feast And shove away the worthy bidden guest. Blind mouths that scarce themselves know how to hold a sheep hook, or have learned aught else the least that to the faithful herdman's art belongs. What wrecks it then? What need they? They are sped, and when they list, their lean and flashy songs grate on their scrannel pipes of wretched straw. The hungry sheep look up, and are not fed, but swollen with wind, and the rank mist they draw, Rot inwardly, and foul contagion spread. Besides what the grim wolf with privy paw Daily devours apace, and nothing said, But that two-handed engine at the door Stands ready to smite once, and smite no more. Return, Alpheus, the dread voice is past, That shrunk thy streams, Return, Sicilian muse, and call the veils, and bid them hither cast their bells and flowerets of a thousand hues. Ye valleys low, where the mild whispers use of shades and wanton winds and gushing brooks, on whose fresh lap the swart star spurly looks, throw hither all your quaint enamelled eyes that on the green turf suck the honeyed showers and purple all the ground with vernal flowers. Bring the wraith primrose that forsaken dies, the tufted croto and pale jessamine, the white pink and the pansy freaked with jeet, the glowing violet, the musk rose and the well-attired woodbine, with cowslips wan that hang the pensive head, and every flower that sad embroidery wears. Bid Amaranthus all his beauty shed, And daffodillies fill their cups with tears, To strew the laureate hearse where Lycid lies. For so to interpose a little ease, Let our frail thoughts dally with false surmise. Ay me, whilst thee the shores and sounding seas Wash far away where'er thy bones are hurled, Whether beyond the stormy Hebrides, where thou perhaps under the whelming tide visitest the bottom of the monstrous world, or whether thou, to our moist vows denied, sleepest by the fable of Belarus old, where the great vision of the guarded mount looks towards the Mancos and Bionas hold. Look homeward, angel, now, and melt with ruth, and, O oh, ye dolphins, waft the hapless youth. Weep no more, woeful shepherds, weep no more, For Lycidas your sorrow is not dead, Sunk though he be beneath the watery floor. So sinks the day-star in the ocean bed, And yet anon repairs his drooping head, And tricks his beams, and with new spangled o'er, Flames in the forehead of the morning sky. So Lycidas sunk low, but mounted high, through the dear might of him that walked the waves, Where other groves and other streams along, With nectar pure his oozy locks he laves, And hears the unexpressive nuptial song, In the blest kingdoms meek of joy and love, There entertain him all the saints above, In solemn troops and sweet societies, That sing, and singing in their glory move, and wipe the tears forever from his eyes. Now, Lysidus, the shepherds weep no more, henceforth thou art the genius of the shore, in thy large recompense, and shalt be good to all that wander in that perilous flood.
Thus sang the uncouth swain to the oaks and rills, While the still morn went out with sandals grey. He touched the tender stops of various quills, With eager thought warbling his Doric lay. And now the sun had stretched out all the hills, And now was dropped into the western bay. At last he rose and twitched his mantle blue, Tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures new. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Nocturnal Upon St. Lucy's Day, Being the Shortest Day, by John Dunn. Read for LibriVox by Barty Begley. Tis the year's midnight, and it is the day's, Lucy's, who scares seven hours herself on masks. The sun is spent, and now his flasks send forth light squibs, no constant rays. The world's whole sap is sunk. The general bam the hydroptic earth had drunk, wither, as to the bed's feet life is shrunk, dead and interred. Yet all these seem to laugh compared with me, who am their epitaph. Study me then, you who shall lovers be at the next world, that is, at the next spring, for I am every dead thing in whom love wrought new alchemy, for his art did express a quintessence even from nothingness. From dull privations and lean emptiness he ruined me, and I am re-begot of absence, darkness, death. Things which are not. All others from all things draw all that's good. Life, soul, form, spirit. Whence they being have. I by love's limbeck am the grave of all. That's nothing. Oft a flood have we two wept. And so drowned the whole world us two. Oft did we grow to be two chaoses, when we did show care to aught else, and often absences withdrew our souls and made us carcasses. But I am by her death, which word wrongs her, of the first nothing the elixir grown. Were I a man that I were when I needs must know, I should prefer, if I were any beast, some ends, some means, ye plants, ye stones detest and love, all, all some properties invest. If I an ordinary nothing were, as shadow, a light and body must be here. But I am none, nor will my sun renew. You lovers, for whose sake the lesser son at this time to the goat is run to fetch new lust and give it you, enjoy your summer all. Since she enjoys her long night's festival, let me prepare towards her, and let me call this hour her vigil and her eve, since this both the years and the days deep midnight is. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. No Second Troy by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Miss Avarice. Why should I blame her that she filled my days with misery, or that she would of late have taught to ignorant men most violent ways, or hurled the little streets upon the great? Had they but courage equal to desire, What could have made her peaceful with a mind, That nobleness made simple as a fire, With beauty like a titan bow, a kind, That is not natural in an age like this, Being high and solitary and most stern? Why, what could she have done being what she is? Was there another Troy for her to burn? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
On the New Forces of Conscience Under the Long Parliament by John Milton, 1647 Read for LibriVox.org by The Bicycle Thief Because you have thrown off your prelate lord, and with stiff vows renounced his liturgy, to seize the widowed whore plurality from them whose sin ye envied, not abhorred, Dare you for this adjure the civil sword To force our consciences that Christ set free, And ride us with a classic hierarchy, Taught ye by mere A.S. and Rutherford? Men whose life, learning, faith, and pure intent Would have been held in high esteem with Paul, Must now be named and printed heretics By shallow Edwards and Scotch what do you call? But we do hope to find out all your tricks, Your plots and packing, worse than those of Trent, That so the Parliament may, with their wholesome and preventative shears, Clip your phylacteries, though bulk your ears, And succour our just fears, When they shall read this clearly in your charge, New presbyter is but old priest writ large. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. On the Sea by John Keats, recorded for LibriVox.org by Joshua S. of the Planet Earth. It keeps eternal whisperings around, desolate shores and with its mighty swell, gluts twice ten thousand caverns till the spell of Hecate leaves them their old shadowy sound. Oft tis in such gentle temper found that scarcely will the very smallest shell be moved for days from whence it sometime fell when last the winds of heaven were unbound. O ye who have your eyeballs vexed and tired, feast them upon the wideness of the sea. O ye whose ears are din with uproar rude or fed too much with clowing melody, sit ye near some old cavern's mouth and brood until ye start as if the sea nymphs quired. End of poem. This recording is under public domain. Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Delmar H. Dolbeer I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, Whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command Tell that its sculptor well those passions read Which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings, Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, Boundless and bare, the lone and level sands Stretch far away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Portrait of a Lady by T. S. Eliot Read for LibriVox.org by Lubet Thou hast committed fornication, but that was in another country, and besides, the wench is dead. The Jew of Malta 1. Among the smoke and fog of a December afternoon, you have the scene arrange itself as it will seem to do with I have saved this afternoon for you. And four wax candles in the darkened room, four rings of light upon the ceiling overhead, an atmosphere of Juliet's tomb prepared for all the things to be said or left unsaid. We have been, let us say, to hear the latest pole transmit the preludes through his hair and fingertips. 
so intimate this Chopin that I think his soul should be resurrected only among friends, some two or three, who will not touch the bloom that is rubbed and questioned in the concert room. And so the conversation slips among velleities and carefully caught regrets, through attenuated tones of violins mingled with remote cornets, and begins. You do not know how much they mean to me, my friends, and how, how rare and strange it is to find in a life composed so much, so much of odds and ends. For indeed I do not love it. You knew? You are not blind. How keen you are! To find a friend who has these qualities, who has and gives those qualities upon which friendship lives. How much it means that I say this to you. Without these friendships, life, what cauchemar! Among the windings of the violins and the ariettes of cracked cornets, Inside my brain a dull tom-tom begins absurdly hammering a prelude of its own, capricious monotone that is at least one definite false note. Let us take the air in a tobacco trance, admire the monuments, discuss the late events, correct our watches by the public clocks, then sit for half an hour and drink our box. 2. Now that lilacs are in bloom, she has a bowl of lilacs in her room and twists one in his fingers while she talks. Ah, my friend, you do not know, you do not know what life is, you who hold it in your hands, slowly twisting the lilac stalks. You let it flow from you, you let it flow, and youth is cruel and has no remorse, and smiles at situations which it cannot see. I smile, of course, and go on drinking tea. Yet with these April sunsets that somehow recall my buried life and Paris in the spring, I feel immeasurably at peace and find the world to be wonderful and youthful after all. The voice returns like the insistent out of tune of a broken violin on an August afternoon. I am always sure that you understand my feelings, always sure that you feel, sure that across the gulf you reach your hand. You are invulnerable, you have no Achilles' heel. You will go on, and when you have prevailed, you can say, at this point, many a one has failed. But what have I, but what have I, my friend, to give you? What can you receive from me? Only the friendship and the sympathy of one about to reach her journey's end. I shall sit here serving tea to friends. I take my hat. How can I make a cowardly amends for what she has said to me? You will see me any morning in the park, reading the comics and the sporting page. Particularly, I remark, an English countess goes upon the stage, a Greek was murdered at a Polish dance, another bank defaulter has confessed. I keep my countenance, I remain self-possessed, except when a street piano, mechanical and tired, reiterates some worn-out common song with the smell of hyacinths across the garden, recalling things that other people have desired. Are these ideas right or wrong? 3. The October night comes down, Returning as before, except for a slight sensation of being ill at ease, I mount the stairs and turn the handle of the door and feel as if I had mounted on my hands and knees. And so you are going abroad, and when do you return? But that's a useless question. You hardly know when you are coming back. You will find so much to learn. My smile falls heavily among the bric-a-brac. Perhaps you can write to me. 
My self-possession flares up for a second. This is as I had reckoned. I have been wondering frequently of late, but our beginnings never know our ends, why we have not developed into friends. I feel like one who smiles and, turning, shall remark suddenly his expression in a glass. My self-possession gutters. We are really in the dark. For everybody said so, all our friends, they all were sure our feelings would relate so closely. I myself can hardly understand. We must leave it now to fate. You will write, at any rate. Perhaps it is not too late. I shall sit here, serving tea to friends. And I must borrow every changing shape to find expression. Dance, dance like a dancing bear. Cry like a parrot. Chatter like an ape. Let us take the air in a tobacco trance. Well, and what if she should die some afternoon? Afternoon gray and smoky. Evening yellow and rose. Should die and leave me sitting, pen in hand with the smoke coming down above the housetops, doubtful for a while, not knowing what to feel or if I understand or whether wise or foolish, tardy or too soon. Would she not have the advantage after all? This music is successful with a dying fall now that we talk of dying. And should I have the right to smile? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Preludes by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Clett. 1. The winter evening settles down with smell of stakes in passageways. 6 o'clock. The burnt out ends of smoky days. And now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet, and newspapers from vacant lots. The showers beat on broken blinds and chimney pots, and at the corner of the street a lonely cab horse steams and stamps, and then the lighting of the lamps. 2. The morning comes to consciousness of faint stale smells of beer from the sawdust trampled street, with all its muddy feet that press to early coffee stands. With the other masquerades that time resumes, one thinks of all the hands that are raising dingy shades in a thousand furnished rooms. 3. You tossed a blanket from the bed, you lay upon your back and waited. You dozed and watched the night revealing the thousand sordid images of which your soul was constituted. They flickered against the ceiling. And when all the world came back, and the light crept up between the shutters, and you heard the sparrows in the gutters, you had such a vision of the street as the street hardly understands, sitting along the bed's edge, where you curled the papers from your hair or clasped the yellow soles of feet in the palms of both soiled hands. 4. His soul stretched tight across the skies that fade behind a city block, or trampled by insistent feet at four and five and six o'clock, and short square fingers stuffing pipes, and evening newspapers, and eyes assured of certain certainties, the conscience of a blackened street, impatient to assume the world. I am moved by fancies that are curled around these images and cling, the notion of some infinitely gentle, infinitely suffering thing. Wipe your hand across your mouth and laugh. The worlds revolve like ancient women, gathering fuel in vacant lots. End of poem this recording is in the public domain.
18 Quatrains from Omar Khayyam, translated by Whitley Stokes, read for LibriVox.org by Barty Begley. Death I dashed my clay cup on the stone hard by. The reckless frolic raised my heart on high. Then said a shard with momentary voice, As thou have I been, thou shalt be as I. Annihilation makes me not to fear. In truth, it seems more sweet than lingering here. My life was sent me as alone unsought. When payday comes, I'll pay without a tear. Has God made profit from my coming? Nay. His glory gains not when I go away. Mine ear has never heard from mortal man this coming and this going. Why are they? I'd not have come had this been left to me, nor would I go to go if I were free. O oh, best of all upon this lonely earth, neither to come nor go, yes, not to be. O oh, that there were some place where men could rest, some end to look for in this lonely quest, some hope that in a hundred thousand years our dust might blossom on the mother's breast. Alas for me, the book of youth is read, the fresh glad spring is now December dead. That bird of joy whose name was youth is flown, ay me, I know not how he came or fled. God, thou art the opener, open thou the door, thou art the teacher, teach my soul to soar. No human masters hold me by the hand. They pass away, thou bidest evermore. I cannot reach the road to join with thee. I cannot bear one breath apart from thee. I dare not tell this grief to any man. Ah, hard, ah, strange, ah, longing sweet for thee. Conduct In school and cloister, mosque and fane, one lies a dread of hell, or dreams of paradise. But none that know the secrets of the Lord have sown their hearts with such like fantasies. Ah, strive amain no human heart to wring. Let no one feel thine anger burn or sting. Wouldst thou be lapped in long enduring joy, know how to suffer, cause no suffering. While sinew vein and bone together blend, Outside the path of doom we cannot wend. Bow not thy neck, though Rustam be thy foe. Be bound to none, though Hatem be thy friend. Consolation This is the time for roses and repose, Beside the stream that by the meadow goes, A friend or two, a sweetheart like a rose, With wine, and none to heed how Muller's prose. Come, bring that ruby in yon crystal bowl, That brother true of every open soul. Thou knowest over well this life of ours Is wind that hurries by, O oh, bring the bowl. With loving lip to lip the bowl I drain, To learn how long my soul must here remain, And lip to lip it whispers while you live, Drink, for once gone you come not back again. Sweet airs are blowing on the rose of May, Sweet eyes are shining down the garden gay. Aught sweet of dead yestreen you cannot say. No more of it. So sweet is this today. When death uproots my life plant ear and grain, And flings them forth to moulder on the plain, If men shall make a wine jug of my clay and brim with wine, twill leap to life again. This jar was once a lover like to me lost in delight of wooing one like thee. And lo, the handle here upon the neck was once the arm that held her neck in fee. Your love-nets hold my hair-forsaken head. Therefore my lips in warning wine are red. Repentance born of reason you have wrecked, and time has torn the robe that patience made. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. This is a recording for LibriVox.org by Siddharth. The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverse in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveller long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had borne them really about the same, and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I... I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. End of poem. All the Brewox recordings are in the public domain. Sketch of Lord Byron's Life by Julia A. Moore. Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug. Perth, Western Australia. Lord Byron was an Englishman, a poet, I believe. His first works in Old England was poorly received. Perhaps it was Lord Byron's fault, and perhaps it was not. His life was full of misfortunes. Ah, strange was his lot. The character of Lord Byron was of low degree, caused by his reckless conduct and bad company. He sprung from an ancient house, noble but poor indeed. His career on earth was marred by his own misdeeds. Generous and tender-hearted, affectionate by extreme, in temper he was wayward, a poor lord without means. Ah, he was a handsome fellow, with great poetic skill, his great intellectual powers he could use at his will. He was a sad child of nature, of fortune and of fame, also sad child to society, for nothing did he gain but slander and ridicule throughout his native land. Thus the poet of the passions lived unappreciated man. Yet at the age of twenty-four, Lord Byron then had gained the highest, highest pinnacle of literary fame. Ah, he had such violent passions, they was beyond his control, yet the public with its justice sometimes would him extol. Sometimes again Lord Byron was censured by the press, such obloquy he could not endure, so he done what was the best. He left his native country, this great unhappy man, the only wish he had, tis said, he might die sword in hand. He had joined the Grecian army, this man of delicate frame, and there he died in a distant land, and left on earth his fame. Lord Byron's age was thirty-six years, then closed the sad career of the most celebrated Englishman of the nineteenth century. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song on May Morning by John Milton Read for LibriVox.org by Nigel Boydell Now the bright morning star, day's harbinger, Comes dancing from the east and leads with her the flowery May, Who from her green lap throws the yellow cowslip and the pale primrose. Hail, bounteous May, that dost inspire mirth and youth and warm desire, Woods and groves are of thy dressing, Hill and dale doth boast thy blessing. Thus we salute thee with our early song, And welcome thee, and wish thee along. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Balloon Laden with Knowledge by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Amy Graymore Bright ball of flame, that through the gloom of even Silently takest thine ethereal way, And with surpassing glory dimmest each ray, Twinkling amid the dark blue depths of heaven, Unlike the fire thou bearest, 
soon shalt thou fade like a meteor in surrounding gloom, whilst that unquenchable is doomed to glow a watchlight by the patriot's lonely tomb, a ray of courage to the oppressed and poor, a spark though gleaming on the hovel's hearth, which through the tyrant's gilded domes shall roar, a beacon in the darkness of the earth, a sun which o'er the renovated scene shall dart like truth where falsehood yet has been. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the First Robin by Louisa May Alcott Read for LibriVox.org by Frieda Schneider Welcome, welcome, little stranger. Fear no harm and fear no danger. We are glad to see you here, for you sing sweet spring is near. Now the white snow melts away, now the flowers blossom gay. Come, dear bird, and build your nest, for we love our robin best. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. Two, by Samuel Rogers, read for LibriVox.org by Sebastian Stevenson. Go, you may call it madness, folly. You shall not chase my gloom away. There is such a charm in melancholy. I would not, if I could, be gay. Oh, if you knew the pensive pleasure that fills my bosom when I sigh, you would not rob me of a treasure. Monarchs are too poor to buy. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Wanderer's Song by John Macefield. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. A wind's in the heart of me, a fire's in my heels. I am tired of brick and stone and rumbling wagon wheels. I hunger for the sea's edge, the limit of the land, where the wild old Atlantic is shouting on the sand. Oh, I'll be going, leaving the noises of the street, to where a lifting foresail foot is yanking at the sheet, to a windy tossing anchorage where yawls and catches ride. Oh, I'll be going, going, until I meet the tide. And first I'll hear the sea wind, the mewing of the gulls, the clucking sucking of the sea about the rusty hulls, the songs at the capstan, at the hooker warping out. And then the heart of me'll know I'm there or thereabout. Oh, I am sick of brick and stone, the heart of me is sick, for windy, green, unquiet sea, the realm of Moby Dick. And I'll be going, going from the roaring of the wheels, for a wind's in the heart of me, a fire's in my heels. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Whispers of Immortality by T. S. Eliot. Read for LibriVox.org by Tricia G. Webster was much possessed by death, and saw the skull beneath the skin, and breastless creatures underground leaned backward with a lipless grin. Daffodil bulbs instead of balls stared from the sockets of the eyes. He knew that thought clings round dead limbs, tightening its lusts and luxuries. Dunn, I suppose, was such another, who found no substitute for sense to seize and clutch and penetrate, expert beyond experience, he knew the anguish of the marrow, the ague of the skeleton, no contact possible to flesh allayed the fear of the bone. Grishkin is nice, her Russian eye is underlined for emphasis, uncorseted, her friendly bust gives promise of pneumatic bliss. The couched Brazilian jaguar compels the scampering marmoset with subtle effluence of cat. Grishkin has a maisonette. The sleek Brazilian jaguar does not in its arboreal gloom distill so rank a feline smell as Grishkin in a drawing-room. And even the abstract entities circumambulate her charm, 
but our lot crawls between dry ribs to keep our metaphysics warm. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Written at Midnight by Samuel Rogers Read for LibriVox.org by Sebastian Stevenson If day reveals such wonders by her light, why by her darkness cannot night reveal? For at her bidding, when she mounts her throne, the heavens unfold, and from the depths of space, sun beyond sun, as when cold forth they came, each with the worlds that round him rolled rejoicing, sun beyond sun in numbers numberless, shine with a radiance that is all their own. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.